I sense suffering here, spirit. Do you need help? Death and corruption. Oh, to remain here. Have you ever had a dream or a goal in mind that you thought about achieving, but a little voice inside of your head just told you that it wasn't possible? Oftentimes, the reason why is because we haven't closely examined someone who looks like us, talks like us, or grew up in the same circumstances. And thus, it's hard to imagine what the road actually looks like. Many times, what is normal reality to someone may be a distant, unachievable fantasy to others. The biggest factor in this sort of dichotomy often comes down to just one factor, visibility. If you don't actually know or see what's out there, you literally don't know that you don't know. That brings us to today's video where we're going to talk about and explore the very interesting, imaginative story of brothers Josh and Mike Greer, the owners of Ember Lab and their smash hit PS4 and PS5 game, Kena Bridge of Spirits. We'll also learn about their journey growing up quite literally surrounded by the land of dreams and how they've recognized the lack of diversity in the industry and how they can serve and bring awareness of gaming career paths to underdeveloped communities. Our story starts off in the 90s in Orlando, Florida, where surrounded by dirt roads and meadows, the Greer brothers would spend much of their days outside exploring, but also in the backyard playing basketball. Their parents made sure they had every opportunity to explore the outdoors, but also made sure to foster their creativity and encourage them to tinker, try things, and not be afraid of failure. Their household was not like most, as their father, Ed, actually worked nearby at a place you may have heard of. Disney. Yeah, like Disney Disney. He worked for Disney for about 28 years and during the 90s, he was an executive for the theme park operations. Being so close in proximity with the Disney parks, Mike and Josh were able to see the inner workings of the character and stories that got created and told. Especially in the summers where they got to not only explore Disney World, but also go to work with their father and see for themselves the scale of the projects that they had going on and how they were managed. They got to see that each team member had a specific role that contributed to the final outcome. For Josh, especially, he got to closely observe the business side of things, which came more natural to him. Growing up, this all had a profound effect on their mindset, instilling the belief that if you can dream it, you can do it. The nature of Ed's role meant that they had to do a little bit of traveling here and there, especially as he was able to climb the ladder within Disney. When Josh was six and Mike was four, Ed, along with other team members, was tasked with the opening of Euro Disney in Paris, France, which was the biggest move for the brothers at the time. They would stay for 18 months, and during this time, they would continue to see the inner workings of the creative projects that went on. But it was also a bit of a difficult transition for them, as they didn't speak the native language that well. This wouldn't be that big of an issue for them, however, as during this time, their bond grew deeply through shared entertainment mediums, that being animated films and gaming, which really helped them feel at home no matter where they traveled to. They became huge fans of Hayao Miyazaki and the work of Studio Ghibli, and they would spend countless hours watching them together. I found this pretty cool, and many of you could probably relate to this, but they actually had a family ritual around Zelda. And so anytime a new title came out on the Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Game Boy, and 64, they would get a launch copy and crowd the TV, taking turns, experiencing the new story and gameplay features. And I'm sure drawing lots of excitement over defeating bosses and racing to get the Master Sword. It seems Majora's Mask is one they definitely had lasting memories of with this darker undertone, but we'll revisit this in just a little bit, trust me. In the early 2000s, their father would later be named the Vice President of Tokyo Disney, while Josh was in college at Northwestern University, where he studied economics as business was one of his big passions. 
While in college, Mike would live in Tokyo with his father for three years where his creativity and inspiration would expand immensely. He would spend lots of his free time exploring the countryside and taking pictures of the landscape. The train rides would take him away from all of the Tokyo skyscrapers and populated city areas and into the farmlands, ancient temples, and overall beautiful natural environments. Mike recalls that some of the best photos were of abandoned structures and buildings that were taken over by nature. Mike says, I met many locals who were very helpful and eager to show me off the beaten path locations. They helped me find old trails and locations few travelers to Japan ever see. Mike would attend Temple University in Tokyo, studying communications and media, and would graduate in 2006 and later attend Chapman University for film and video studies. While attending school in Tokyo, he began his career as a digital artist, working on various print and digital media projects that appealed to both Japanese and American markets. His talents became clear and immediate as he soon rose to become the creative director, all while attending school and honing his craft. Josh, on the other hand, post-graduation, took on his role as a retail sales manager at the Disneyland Resort in Anaheim, California, where among many different accomplishments and while wearing many different hats, he led an initiative that redefined the scope of their marketing projects. He also developed the Disney gift card program at Disneyland Resort. Overall, he gained tons of experience in marketing, but also as an operator within the company. 2009 would be a pretty big year for the family. During that year, Mike and Josh reflected on their love of both animation and video games and found that their passion for film and their natural gifts and creativity in business could be a great overlap. This led them to start their own studio, Ember Lab. Also that year, Ed, their father, would step down from his role as president of Disney Tokyo and pursue new opportunities. And speaking of opportunities, he was sure to use much of his time to help and support Mike and Joss on their new ventures starting Ember Lab. When it came to the naming of their studio, the brothers explained, Embers are an excellent representation of story ideas. They can remain with us burning long after the story ends. They can travel across cultures, nations, and continents, exploding into fiery excitement. It's been a dream of ours to inspire future generations of storytellers, just as we were inspired. We wanted our name to capture some of that do-it-yourself and entrepreneurial spirit that pushed us to try new things. The lab for us represents pushing boundaries and finding new ways to tell stories. We founded the studio with the goal of creating immersive content through compelling characters and cinematic worlds. Another one of their initial goals was to develop enough resources and have a collaborative environment to create their own short film that they started that year called Dust. The film depicts a rapid and ever-changing world that is filled with not only dangerous species, but illness and death that is directly connected with the newly discovered dust that falls onto the city. The team for the film spanned many different skill and talent fields, from audio and lighting to outfit designing and makeup artists, as well as concept art and 3D modeling. The film was mostly shot in Shikoku, Japan, where Mike spent lots of time hiking and exploring upon exiting his train rides. In fact, it was Mike's travels while in Japan that influenced most of the themes in Dust, especially when he got to conversate with the locals and closely observe abandoned man-made locales being reclaimed by nature over time. The project was undergone while Mike was still in school, and the team even got to use the school's resources when it came to recreating the opening workshop scene. The team was small but highly productive, which included volunteers as well as a friend from Disney. The final film release put the talents, artistry, and hard work of the team at Ember Lab, as well as the other amazing individuals, on the full display, with high, cinematic quality, lighting, sound, and storytelling. One major part of maintaining the team's structure going forward was ensuring that the project was going to be fully funded. During the post-production of Dust, the team used their experience to take on advertisement projects. 
where they specialize in creating unique and inspiring character stories. They will start off small, but eventually they have some pretty major clients, including Coca-Cola, KFC, Hisense, and even the MLB. The work varied, but much of it utilized their strengths in character modeling and animation, but would also include many gaming apps for KFC and Coca-Cola, which you could see that as being their initial experience in game development. But this reminded me of the Burger King Sneak King game that came out in 360 years ago. Let me know if you remember that down below in the comments. Each project the studio took on pushed them to grow and help develop their capabilities. Mike spoke of their experience during this time of taking on clients for ad campaigns. Our first major client was Coca-Cola, Mike Greer said. From there, we grew organically and the studio eventually became known for developing commercials featuring CG characters in live action environments. We have always tried to invest in ourselves developing our own project between commercial work. They were able to complete their short film Dust in early 2013 with the help of some great backers through their fully funded Kickstarter campaign. And it would go on to win many awards, including Best Film, Best Sci-Fi, Best Visual Effects, Best Art Direction, and Best Cinematography. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to take a look at the amazing work that the team did with this. The journey of Dust, especially the projects that they took on in between post-production, really helped Mike and Josh see the immense possibilities of their team and for the future of Ember Lab. Their passions and goals of creating fantastical characters and stories in the film and ad space were realized, but there was one area that they wanted to dip their feet into, and that takes us back to their childhood family memories centered around the Zelda franchise, as well as to a connection and team member that was doing some pretty interesting projects of his own. A music artist that they worked closely with for Dust, who goes by the name of Theophany, had worked on his own remix album, which played tribute to the amazing Majora's Mask that the brothers remembered fondly. The brothers had a great idea of creating a passion project to convey and visualize the story, emotion, and darker themes of the album and the original game. The crew of about six went into a forest with their camera gear and utilized some nifty LED lighting techniques that they learned as well as 3 animation talents to bring to life the 2016 viral trailer that we all drooled over and many people like myself immediately thought of the possibilities of it being extended into a full movie. I don't know if you guys remember when the trailer came out in 2016 for Majora's Mask, A Terrible Fate, but that trailer sent shockwaves across the gaming world. And for many Zelda fans like myself, it just stole our hearts. And we were just gushing over the visuals and storytelling of this short but sweet trailer. And for a lot of us, this was the first time that we were introduced to Ember Lab's work. This will be the turning point for the team. As much of their passion as they poured into the making of the short trailer, they certainly didn't expect it to blow up as it did. But it was part of a bigger plan that they had brewing that started back when they were developing small game apps for Coca-Cola. You see, during this time, they had experimented with Epic Games' Unreal Engine, which they felt they could utilize to bring their film and ad experience into the gaming space. This experience got them feeling more comfortable with the idea of taking their experience into the gaming world. Even with all the experience that they had in digital art, animation, storytelling, and mobile game development, they were entering into some pretty unknown territory. But they had full confidence in the team in-house, as well as connections they had built, spanning engineering and development. They knew that as long as they could find the right partners and delegate effectively, their ideas would be brought to life. When it came to roles on the project, Though Mike and Jaws have the same passion, their strengths differ in ways that would make it easy to determine roles. While Jaws specialized in big picture management as chief operating officer, Mike was the main creative mind as the chief of creative. The theme of the game that they landed on centered around people struggling with loss and struggling with the mistake they made and the desire to reconcile it. Something that many people can get behind and relate to on some level. 
It's been a dream of mine to try and spark future generations of creators the same way I was inspired. When we initially started developing story ideas, we thought it might be an animated series or film. But once we started developing the concept of The Rot, we knew it had to be a game. We wanted to be able to go on adventures with The Rot and explore the world with them. The Rot ended up being the crucial element that helped us intertwine the gameplay with the story we wanted to tell. The player's journey with The Rot as they find and grow their team reflects many of the themes in the game. Also, they are a lot of fun. For the protagonist, it wasn't a hard choice for them to go with an Asian female as diversity is both natural and important to their storytelling. What was also important is the theme and narrative of the game, as one of the biggest draws to gaming growing up for them was the connection that they felt with both the character and their personal journey. They found some great talents across the globe from the UK to Thailand and Vietnam and they were able to work together both virtually and in person during the initial concepts and ideas that they worked with to ensure that everyone was on the same page as far as look, feel, tone, and overall consistency. Speaking of ideas, they drew from their inspiration in both film and gaming. On the gaming side, they looked towards both Zelda and the artistic game and story of Okami. For the film side, a lot of inspiration came from the work of Akira Kurosawa and his film Rashomon, which has a focus on different points of view on the same events. There's also the work at Studio Ghibli, Disney, and Pixar, which you could have guessed from just one look at the main protagonist and the creatures known as the rot within the game. I mentioned their partnerships with talents in various parts of the world and one major studio that they work closely with is called Sparks. Located in Vietnam, they were responsible mainly for bringing forth the environmental ideas to life. Mike worked closely with them to ensure that they were on the same page as far as art direction. They were able to bring together a world that was inspired by Japan, Bali, and other eastern locations. We've talked a lot about the different artistic aspects of Kena and that is certainly where the strength of Ember Lab's core team lies, but one major challenge that they faced was the actual development of the game. And for that, they brought in engineers that had far more experience than they had. They would later discover, through working with the engineers and closely observing the progress of the game, that there was a need to adjust the narrative to fit what was actually fun. They had quite a lot of challenges being a first-time game studio. But they were motivated by the problem solving that came from the clashing philosophies of game design versus the film industry. This was definitely apparent when it came to playtesting the game, because in the film industry you have a lot more control over the viewing experience. But in games, when you have to hand over the controller, you let the player take control and decide for themselves what looks and feels nice, and most importantly, fun. The brothers admitted that playtesting did come a bit late but once they were open to it, they were able to move faster and make decisions based on what people enjoyed and connected with. They didn't have access to a lot of playtesters with the team size that they had. At their peak, they had about 15 members, but they utilized their circle of family and friends to fill in those gaps, which went a long way as they were able to iterate on ideas fast by watching gamers live. They kept meeting huge milestones with their game through March of 2017, and it was finally time for the team to create a Polis working model to present and talk about finding the right partners for funding the game further. Perhaps unsurprisingly, many gaming giants reacted positively and offered to partner with Ember Lab, but one company whose deal they accepted in October was an absolute no-brainer, Sony. Now of course this was the biggest opportunity for them as far as getting more awareness and funding, but there was also a major benefit for them in accepting the deal. You see, up until this point, the team at Ember Lab was only working towards a PS4 release, as they only had the resources for that console. But once they partnered with Sony for funding, Sony allowed them to have a sneak peek and use their PS5 dev kit right away so that they could have a dual launch and expand further on the gameplay features. The Greer brothers felt that this was the perfect match, saying, They are pretty committed and passionate about fostering creative teams like ours, 
were doing this kind of work. The team worked tirelessly in-house and maintained strong communication with their outsourced studios in person as often as possible. But then 2020 hit, and as you can imagine, production slowed down a bit. But this wouldn't take a huge toll on the team, especially with the systems that they had in place and the progress they had made. But there were certainly obstacles they had to overcome, like not being able to reach over to an in-house team member to get some feedback, or trying to do some playtests via Zoom and things like that, as most of their team members became remote during this time. The team at Ember Labs were able to readjust and stay committed to showing a first look at the game during the June 2020 PS5 Showcase. The 2020 reveal of the PS5 lineup showcase was pretty major in the gaming industry last year. It was set to be unveiled right after Destruction All-Stars, and right after the PlayStation transition faded to black, the Greer brothers appeared and introduced themselves to the audience and walked them through their newest project for current and next generation PlayStation. The game was about to be seen by the eyes of gamers across the globe, including some of their friends and family, some of which had no clue that they were involved in the gaming industry. My phone blew up with messages from people I hadn't talked to in a while, like, I saw you on the PlayStation 5 showcase. Most people didn't know we were working on Kena, but no one was expecting our faces to be up there. Mike asked that they have inspired those closest to them to the possibility of working within the gaming industry, saying, When we talk to our cousins, it's like, wow, they didn't think it was a possibility before, he explains. They didn't think this is a career path that they could take. The 2020 showcase was a huge success for them and bringing awareness to the talented team and their major projects spanning four to five years. They were closing in on the home stretch now as they close out the year. Though the PS5 reveal was definitely a defining moment for their studio, it wouldn't be the last time they would be able to present pre-launch, as they were accepted to be able to present at the 2021 Tribeca Film Festival this past June. This would be the first time that video games have been shown at the festival, and of course, this helped Ember Lab shine even more light on Kena months before the release. The big day arrived for the team to see all of their efforts, love, and emotions that they poured into the game and their close-knit team. They managed to cross over from their roots in film and advertising while utilizing their team skill and experience to bring beautiful characters, story, environment, and even 45 minutes of animated cutscenes to a final product assisted heavily once again by the audio from their close friend Theophany. They also worked with a great music artist by the name of Dua Puta Barada. I hope I pronounced his name right, I'm not sure, uh, but he also has a daughter uh, named Ayu, who by the way had her first voice acting role as the main protagonist, Kena. The brothers looked back and commented on their first outing in the gaming industry. Our experience in the game development community has been overwhelmingly positive. Making games is hard and there is a sense of camaraderie and support that exists in the industry. I think our commercial work that we did prepared us for this. Because in the commercial space, you've got like a minute to tell the best story you can with as few shots as you can. Kana was received very well and it even looks like Sony is pretty happy with the success. Not only for its popularity, but also its financial success as it was able to generate its full production costs relatively quickly. In fact, only around a month after its release, which is spectacular. They later teased their consideration for changing mediums in the future, saying, Kana and the universe we built has a lot of storytelling potential. So exploring and taking it into a more linear experience like a TV show or film is a possibility. The brothers never stopped thinking about their upbringing, their exposure, and now their position as one of the only black-owned development studios in the gaming industry. And as great as the industry is, there are not many diverse people working within it. And the Greer brothers have worked previously and currently to expose and educate kids on what is possible outside of traditional career paths. In an interview, Josh said, I think a lot of people in our community have the potential but don't have the access or the exposure of knowing someone who is in the industry. For us, a lot of what we have gotten is based on opportunity. 
And seeing people like us in positions that we aspire to is critical. They have great hope moving forward, especially with advances in technology and the growing availability of gaming software, like the free Unreal Engine that they use. The brothers shared that a major task in spreading awareness for youth would be to volunteer in schools and clubs so that kids can see firsthand and face the makers of their favorite games and they can see what can be possible and what steps to take. For those who have aspirations of being in gaming, Josh has some great advice that the team at Ember Lab follow with great results, which is to keep yourself busy with projects of your own. Even if there is no budget, getting our hands dirty and getting in there and learning the tools through a project is something that we have found has helped us. That struggle of learning the tools on your own makes you strong when those doors are open to you. Today, Mike and Josh are still closely observing the feedback of Kena and ensuring that they are addressing any issues post-launch while also considering what they can do to expand on the deep, rich world of Kena which could possibly mean DLC in the future. But what I found most interesting is their commitment to doing their part to help spread awareness to kids who may otherwise never discover the possibilities in gaming, at least not past picking up a controller to play. So this was definitely a longer video than I thought, but I had a blast discovering the journey of Mike and Josh Greer, as well as the team at Ember Lab. But hey, if you did too, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe as it helps a ton. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and I'll catch you all soon. Take care.